Good afternoon. Uh, calibrating JVM on Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes has for sure become already industry standard for deploying containerized applications in the cloud, in general probably, uh, because it simplifies it m a lot. And on the other hand, it doesn't impose vendor lock, so we can easily move your Kubernetes infrastructure between cloud providers without big issues probably. But anyway, even though it simplifies a lot, it, there are still some challenges that we are facing. And the challenges related with a Java application, or in general, JVM applications deployment, we are going to uh, tackle today. And hello, I'm Krzysztof, and I'm data engineer. And data engineer position is probably the most DevOps-like thing in the market. So we are, in general, we are coding every day, but probably the equal amount of time we're spending on calibrating our deployments, making sure that the stuff are going fine, even, even on huge load. Uh, and I'm working at SwissWork. This is a pretty fancy company. We are having an app for uh, buying cryptocurrencies, but it's not like trading platform. It's more like wealth management uh, yeah, of your money, of your assets. You're putting your, your, your money, you're converting them to crypto, and cryptos are working for you uh, making your profit every day. And a few numbers, we already uh, collected almost two billions of dollars of assets under management. We have around half a million verified users. And today my company give me a couple of swags to give you. So during the presentation, I will ask uh, some questions and for, cor for correct answers, you will receive at the end of the talk uh, a gift from my company. And by the way, we are hiring, so if you're interested, go to our website or to this QR code and apply for a position. So when we talk about calibrating applications on Kubernetes, there are probably a couple of things that we may consider, um, like storage, network access, maybe some kind, uh, so sometimes access to GPU if we are deploying um, machine learning algorithms. But today we are going to focus only on memory and CPU because these are the most important parts of our deployments and the parts that are affecting performance and, and can, can cause problems in the, biggest, uh, in the biggest way. And also, these are the things that <laughs> contribute to the monthly bill that we pay uh, at our cloud provider, uh, provider mostly. And we are going to cover this on different level of, of abstractions. Uh, we'll start from operating system and talk about some basic stuff, but it's always good to uh, refresh them. Then we'll go to uh, JVM specifics. We'll look into some uh, Docker implementation things. Uh, then we see how Docker works with JVM. And then at the end, Sherry, Sherry on the top of a cake, we'll cover some things related to Kubernetes. So uh, let's start with operating system. One disclaimer, these things will be pretty simple, but it's good to get a good intuition before we'll move uh, towards some more complicated stuff. So let's imagine that our operating system is a restaurant. Uh, as in normal restaurants, there are cl clients that come to order some food, and restaurant provides the food, and providing food means some kind of computation needed to be executed on our operating system. And so in our restaurant, we have four positions on the menu, and each position on the menu means that we have a recipe in our restaurant. Recipe is a process. And basically, uh, on, in our restaurants, we have also a team of chefs, and the chefs are CPU cores, and there is also a big table in the kitchen, is a workspace, memory, and each of the recipe has a reserved space in this, in, in this table kitchen, uh, a kitchen in the table, and that is like allocated to this particular recipe and the dish is prepared on this. And of course, uh, one important thing, we often, we often imagine processes as something that is running, executing some, something lively, uh, but it's, it's a bad intuition because a uh, process is something 
quite that. So it's a, a bunch of bytes living in main memory that it's not executing itself. It's being executed by CPU cores. And only when the chef or CPU core uh, comes to our recipe or process, then execution happens. And that's very important to have in mind when we think about processes. And a few things about the kitchen table. So uh, memory, uh, physical memory in our system is linear. It starts at zero index, goes to some uh, big index at the end. And each of our process is given a portion of it. And all modern, ob modern operating system uh, has functionality of virtual memory. That means that each process will receive a linear piece of memory, like virtual linear piece of memory, probably typically starting at zero index. And this virtual memory will be translated by memory management unit of the, our operating system to particular different addresses throughout the, the whole physical space of our physical memory. And uh, this is very useful uh, because our, our processes are much simplified and also it adds additional functionality, functionality to, to memory uh, allocation uh, along for, for the thing that if we run out of our memory, uh, we, we may still cope with that. So let's imagine that in the basement of our restaurant, we have a very big table, much bigger from the one that we, that we have on the ground. And in case that we run out of the space in the kitchen uh, on the table, we can put some of the stuff from the kitchen to the basement and still ha continue on processing and preparing dishes. Uh, the important thing is that we can't process things in the basement. So basement is a secondary memory. It's, it's hard to this drive. So when we run out of main memory, we dump some things to the, to, the, to the disk. Then we load another things to main memory, process them, and dump them again to, to the hard disk drive. And this process, this functionality is called paging or sweep or swapping. So I, I found those two names being used interchangeably uh, in the internet on different sites. And let's get back to our chefs. So one important guy to mention is this guy in the corner, is a manager who basically orders chefs which dishes they are to, be, uh, to, are, are, are to prepare. And this guy is scheduler. And it's not the recipes, it's not chefs that decides which dish is now being prepared, it's the scheduler. And it may happen that currently we, are, we have no demand on salad and on pasta. So scheduler assign chefs accordingly to the demand to which this dish is now being requested. And a quick summary, uh, just to point out the most important things, is that uh, memory is requested and released by processes. So probably you remember malloc and free commands from C++ or C. Uh, it, it's, it's a duty of process. That means that process may sometimes evaluate some limits that are posted on, on it. So it's just being greedy, request more and more memory, and then end up, well, exceeding some limits. And on the other hand, CPU is outside of process scope. So process just have some computation, but it's not requesting CPU. It's scheduler that's giving CPU time and, and taking it back. And, and so the only possible calibration of how much CPU is being given to process is, is to be done only from operating system level, not from the process level. OK, and so we briefly covered the things relating with operating system. Let's go to Java Virtual Machine. So Java is nothing more than a simple process at operating system. And so all the rules that we already discussed applies to Java as well. And so uh, it's Java. It's Java process that allocates and releases memory. But one important thing, we, we do not care about it in our source code, source code as, we, as we do in C or C++. Uh, it's like Java abstraction that manages it. Uh, but we have some parameters in which we can influence how Java manages memory. The, the two most important ones are XMS and XMX. Uh, which are to define the initial heap size and the maximum size of the heap till which Java can grow it. And a couple of questions. Um, let's imagine example context. We have three gigs of free RAM on our machine, and this is like 
um, this is the amount that is left after we subtract the memories taken by system, other processes, and so on. So three gigs of free memory for our process. And what if XMS value, so the initial heap space, is set to, to value bigger than four gigs? Any, any ideas? What will happen? Will it start? No. no. <laughs> Gift for you. There will be a startup error because we do not have that much space to initialize the, the, the heap at the beginning. Or if uh, XMX is set to bigger than 4 gigs, so the limit is bigger than what we have physically on the machine. Ra raise a hand on the answer. What will happen? Yeah. Yeah, we'll get back to this. Yeah, but it will start. Yeah, JVM starts fine. Swags for you at the end of the talk. XMX is set to value 2 gigs, so below, yeah, it's fine within our space. But JVM goes at some point close to this limit. What will happen? Yeah? 100% CPU and GPU will work like crazy. Yeah, G <laughs> exactly. So that's for you. GC will actively work and try to free the memory, yeah, and do what it can. What if XMX is set to 2 gigs? The whole memory is taken, GC doesn't help anymore, and but we need to allocate ma more objects. What will happen? Hands up. Yeah, out of memory error. Double swags for you. And last question from the slide. XMX bigger than 4 gigs. Uh, we haven't exceed XMX, but we already exceed what we have available physically. OK? So we, for example, we set XMX to 16 gigs. We already uh, we are close to four gigs, and we are crossing the the threshold. What happens? Swapping. Exactly swapping. So JVM goes on fine. Uh, we we start swapping. So yeah, no, no error, no critical situation. But it may become very critical, and we, we may not we may not be aware of it because when the swapping happens rarely, it's fine. It's okay. We we are not killing our application. But when, we, we, when it's going too far and we are basically swapping all the time, we call it trashing. So basically, uh, performance goes drastically down, and basically our app is unusable, and we, do not, we are not aware of it, of it, of it. We are not notified about this. So this is more dangerous than when JVM is killed basically by the system. And one more question. Does JVM ever release previously allocated memory back to operating system? So it Ask for something, and does it does it happen that it releases it back? Okay, who is for yes? <laughs> who is for no? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends on JVM on implementation. Hotspot and OpenJDK, yes. IBM Eclipse, for example, no. But anyway, it happens rarely because when you requested memory once, probably you need it again and again and again. But it happens. It may happen. And basically, in the newest versions of, of JVM, it happens, especially on idle times, idle times of JVM. Nothing, nothing is processing. Then GC starts to release some memory. Um, OK. And one more uh, case. Um, so four gigs of memory. We want to avoid memory paging because it's dangerous. And should we then specify XMX to four gigs? Uh, raise a hand. Yeah, no, why? The stack memory, not exactly is the thing. Yeah, so basically JVM memory is not only heap. Heap is a big is the biggest part, but not it's not the all of the memory. There are plenty of other stuff like garbage collector structures, JIT, both for storing the compilated code and for its working, like yeah, memory needed by compiler. Metaspace, of course, all the classes loaded, uh, some identifiers and stuff like this in system hash tables, and threads and here stacks. Maybe you had this in mind. So threads mainly consume the memory uh, due to their stacks. An important thing that often we forget about is that there is also some memory needed by JVM that is outside of its, it's not assigned to, to JVM process. Uh, when JVM allocates memory outside the heap, that's the case. That is like start consuming memory. That is like being taken from the system, but not being identified like as a memory consumed by JVM. And these are those direct buffers. 
And also, uh, when J yeah, JVM uses native libraries and memory consumed by the nat native libraries is not like accounted for JVM process. So we need to keep in, in, in mind that there's some memory that will be still used outside of JVM process. And the conclusion is that it's too complicated to comp compute exactly which part will take how much memory, and we need to um, we need to take some kind of empirical approach uh, just to cope with this. But anyway, what I can tell at this moment, giving to the heap 60% of the available memory is a good good thing. It is probably typically the def it should be a default choice. We can empiric empirically calibrate it more exactly, but at this moment, 60% is it could be fine. And let's go go forward to JVM CPU. So basically, uh, the most basic stuff is that Java threads are mapped to operating system threads, which is not always the case in other languages. For example, in Erlang, uh, there is a notion of internal processes, which are managed in like in the runtime. They are internally managed which task of those processes is being executed now at, at the thread that is being given from operating system. By the way, it was also a case in Java in very early versions. There was a notion of green thread, and JVM was at the time a single-threaded process, and Java managed which, which tasks were executed on this thread. But they dropped this approach very early, and now we have yeah, threads mapped to operating system. And so because those threads are mapped to operating system, Java has no impact uh, what is being executed and when and for how long. It's totally a thing of operating system. But do we have any CPU-related parameters for JVM? Well, we do not have anything that would be a, a counterpart of XMS and XMX, but we have some. So um, who knows what this command returns? Yeah number of available CPU cores on, on current system. And this is something that Java relies internally. For example, basing on this value, the number of garbage collector threads is defined, the number of JIT threads, and the size of um, fork join pool. So this is quite important parameter. And there is an option to override the value that Java sees here. We can, of course, decrease it uh, if we will want to narrow it. But the funny thing is that we can bump it as well. Probably there is no valid case for this, but yeah. So there is some parameter for CPU-related things in JVM. And that's regarding JVM. Let's go to the Docker. And few words uh, about JVM versus containers. So why do we like and why do we use virtual machines in general? Because they provide logical isolation. So at the same hardware, we can run almost entirely isolated applications, and they won't crash one another. And this is, this is cool. We, in, in this way, we can utilize like cloud infrastructure and so on. But why do we, we like containers even more? Because we are getting almost the same isolation, but at much lower cost, because we do not emulate uh, the, the hardware. We do not bootstrap entire operating system. We are just limiting accesses using some Linux features, and basically, particular like container is just a process on, on our host operating system. And how is it possible? Due to the two functionalities of, for example, Linux, which are, which are namespaces and control groups. Namespaces uh, has a functionality of providing individual view of operating system per particular process or, or process group. So that means that particular process uh, sees its own space of, for example, processes IDs or user IDs or mounted devices and so on. And control groups is a functionality of limiting and distributing access to so-called subsystems, which are in general resources, for example, to CPU time, to memory, and to a functionality, functionality that was mentioned already, swapping. And this is something that we're going to rely on later. So getting into details, uh, C groups uh, regarding memory uh, provide functionally functionality just for limiting its allocation. Uh, so it's not rich, but it's enough. We just limit that particular group of processes cannot exceed particular limit of memory uh, that, is, that they are using. And we have soft and hard limits. Soft are used only for debugging because they are like printing 
warns if we, if we cross the, the soft limit. Hard limits are what we are using basically in Docker. And question, what happens if uh, processes from group tries to uh, cross the limit of, of memory? Question to you. Okay, the first one was in the background. Ah, uh, yes and no. Do you know why yes and no? Uh, okay. But what may kick in before killing? Some, something that was already mentioned today. Swapping. So basically, and this is, this is not very uh, known widely, so basically sometimes we, we reach the limit and process is not being killed, it's becoming very slowly, because uh, when we reach memory limit, the, the process m may start swapping. It's not alway, always the case because swapping might be disabled on the, on the system or might be disabled in, so in C groups. But anyway, it may happen. And then if we, if we accept swapping, there is killing, and if we have swapping disabled, yes, we have, we have execution uh, of death penalty on our po process. And regarding CPU, we have uh, much richer types of management, not only limiting. We have, for example, CPU sets, which is a functionality that we uh, explicitly set particular process to be executed on particular threads. For example, thread number one, three, and five. Something like this. Um, we have CPU shares, which is something like defining priori priority ratio between different processes. And it's not, it's, it's purely relative. So we need to sum all the shares of the all processes, and then we know um, what's the ratio between our process value and the, and the total sum. And there is also a lim limitation rule that is CPU quotas and CPU period, basically saying that per particular period you can use CPU only for this time. So if it's like 50 milliseconds per 100 milliseconds, then you are using half a core at time. If it's 200 milliseconds per, per 100 milliseconds, you are, you are able to use uh, two cores at time. And we can combine quotas with shares. So um, before we reach the quota threshold, um, the, the time is distributed along the sh uh, according to the shares, and when we reach the limit, then the shares are recomputed and so on. Okay, and so the, uh, and of course, Docker uses those techniques, right? A memory a limitation and the CPU shares and quotas. And how they cooperate together, Docker with J Java Virtual Machine. So there was a problem. The problem was following. So. When we were running J JVM in virtual machine, so Java, when it was starting and was, uh, was finding a initial val value for the, the default value for the maximum heap size, it was checking what's the available memory on the, on, the, uh, on the node and taking a fraction of it as a maximum memory limit. And so it was asking a guest OS what's the memory. And so it was starting with particular par parameter, for example, one fourth of the available space. And the same thing with the number of, of cores, right? And when we uh, were running JVM in, uh, in Docker container, basically Java was asking the same, but was skipping C groups and asking directly the, the operating system. So C groups was, was putting limits on, for example, 4 gigs. On the node, there were 64. And so JVM thought, yeah, I have 64 gigs to, to use. And so the initial heap size was one four of it, so, so much more than the limit was put. And that was a problem till Java 8. And we, we say that Java 8 was not container aware. It's it is now because some changes were backported, but till Java 8, it was a problem. Then Java 9 improved a bit, uh, but it was far not enough. And then since Java 10 and the changes from Java 10 were, were backported to 8 and 9, we, we uh, say about container awareness. So basically, uh, since Java 10, uh, JVM sees the memory limits posed by C groups, and also C is aware of the CPU shares. And these CPU shares are interpreted in the following way, that 1044, uh, like value of CPU shares, is interpreted that Java is, has like available one core. So if we give CPU shares of 3,000 something, then the value returned by this runtime, get runtime available processors will be three, okay? 3,000 will be three, three cores. 
And then start uh, Java 11 added additional feature that we can um, modify the value lit returned by this runtime, get runtime, blah, 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 uh, not to, uh, to the value uh, interpreted from the shares, but from the CPU quota, so from the limit of the CPUs that we are giving to our JVM, which is a better value. Because we, we may put low shares, um, but quota is something that is like, and, and still get more processor because this is relative, but quota is a hard limit. And yeah, sometimes it's better, better to set like this parameter and to rely on this. And also Java 10 added uh, a couple of new uh, initial uh, startup parameters. So we may now express the um, initial heap size as a percentage of available RAM. So if C groups give four gigs of RAM available for JVM, then we put XMS to 20% and we get 20% of those four gigs as an initial heap size, which is much more useful than specifying this explicitly by XMS. And also uh, two more parameters, min RAM percentage and max RAM percentage. And you know, uh, there are a couple of big problems in computer science. Probably the biggest one is proper naming. And well, we still have problems with these namings because what, do we, what would you imagine that min run percentage and max run percentage mean? Min run percentage that is like 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 lower level that we can't like decrease the 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 heap size like more, right? Nothing. <laughs> it's not like that. Basically, both those parameters refer to the maximum heap size, but means uh, but the, the first one means that. It applies to the small uh, RAM spaces when we have RAM below 20, uh, 250 megabytes, and max applies to the situation when the RAM size is 200 bigger than 250 megabytes. So both are are relying are uh, referring to the to the memory limit. And uh, one important thing to remember: uh, we need to pass the value of this per percentage as double. Because if we pass it as an integer, like here, 60 without dot zero, then we have a um, parsing problem. And let's go finally to Kubernetes. So basically, when we talk about Kubernetes, this is like sample pod configuration. And the thing that we are going to cover is the thing in the red box, so the resources calibration. And so far, we talk about containers. And when we start talking about Kubernetes, we start talking also about pods. And when we will talk about pod requests and pod limits for resources, we mean in this thing the sum of all requests and all limits of all containers included within the pod. However, typically, there is one container per one pod. So this is, these values are the same, but they may be, may be more in general. And um, pod requests, not limits, requests are used by Kubernetes for scheduling, so for finding part proper node to send our pods and execute on particular node. And we will cover uh, those four parameters, like limits and requests for CPU and memory. Let's start with CPU requests. So this is this like parameter here. And this is translated to Docker as an option CPU shares. So the uh, the guaranteed amount of processor is enforced by CPU shares options on Docker. And Kubernetes has a notion of millicores. So uh, it's stated in documentation that 1,000 millicores means one CPU. And how it's translated to shares? It's translated in following way that 1,000 millicores means 1,024 CPU shares. And as you remember, I said CPU shares is purely relative. And it depends on, it relies on the total sum of the shares of all the processes on the node. So Kubernetes uh, assures that on a given node, we do not put pods with shares bigger than number of cores times 2024. That means if I assign to a node 1024 shares uh, to the pot 1024 shares it will be guaranteed that it will get one cpu at a time even at the big biggest like load on the on the all pots right because the total capacity is kept limited 
So, th but of course, it may receive more. It's just the guarantee, uh, guaranteed amount of CPU time. And then we have CPU limit, and it's ignored by scheduling. We put the total limit uh, vastly like exceeding the total capacity of the node. And this is translated down to the Docker as CPU quota and CPU period, so those functionali functionalities of C groups of limiting access to the CPU. And uh, question, what will happen if pod exceeds the limit? Uh, enforced by this parameter. So we put, for example, request to 100 millicores and limit to 400 millicores. What happens when pod will exceed this limit? Yeah, you, you were first. Yeah, it won't, because again and again, it's not a process that requests for process, it's scheduler that gives process. Uh, again, it's not process that acts, process that asks for CPU, it's scheduler that gives CPU to processes. So if we state that you are given this much of CPU and nothing more, then you won't be given nothing more. You, you can't exceed the limit, right? It's just an instruction for the for the kubelet on, on the particular node and C groups. But is it worth to specify CPU limit? Actually, it's not useful at all. <laughs> so yeah, there might be some cases if we want some kind of productivity at very high level. Because, you know, CPU shares uh, are only things that are relative. So when, when the node is, is in idle state, so we have, for example, four pods, and only one has some computation to be, to be done, and other three are just waiting, then why not this, this, busy, this busy pot takes all the computational power? Other, others are not needed, are not needing them, right? So if we put a limit on it, even if the node is, is idling, well, you use only one core because you're limited. Well, we are wasting CPU, we don't care, because you, you have a limit, right? And if we do not put limit, we, we enable a situation when the pot utilizes the avail available uh, idling type of the CPU. And basically, it's very beneficial not to put CPU limit. Sometimes people say that, well, you put limit and you know what, what will happen. So basically, putting a limit is like, you, it gives you predictability how much processor you will use. But who cares, really? I, I haven't found a situation when th that would be useful at all. And then uh, there's an interesting CPU strategy for uh, config calibrating um, Kubernetes. What if we not specify request nor limit? So that would mean that on the idle time, so uh, nothing is being computed on the node, our pod with no request and no limit will, f will have free access to all the resources of CPU, so it will execute. But if it happens that any of other pods has some computation to do, our pod will be throt throttled as, as immediately, and then this other container computes. And then when there's, again, an idle time, our pod gets back and, and execute processing. So, th so this is a very useful situation when we have some, mm, let's say, batch jobs that needs to do heavy computation. They are not very limited as regards the um, the deadline time that we want, for, for example, we want this processing to be executed by, I don't know, next hour or something like this, but it may just run in the background on the idle times and so on and so on. And then we are just burning our CPUs to the 100% and yeah, running our, our software, not affecting other pods. So this is a very good strategy for, for example, for learning uh, machine learning models. And okay, let's go to the memory requests. Uh, so it's used only for scheduling. We assure that memory request sum doesn't exceed the capacity of the node, but the memory request is not translated down to the Docker. It's not needed. And we have memory limit. And yeah, limits are not used for scheduling, that sum of limits may exceed the capacity of the pod. And the memory limit is translated down to the Docker as a memory parameter. And basically, memory parameter is translated down to the C groups as a memory limit on C groups level. And again, what happens when container exceeds memory limit? Normally, container would start swapping, 
but Kubernetes disabled swapping by default and basically enforces swapping to be, to be turned off. However, I checked that the newest version of Kubernetes added some kind of alpha feature of enabling swapping, but anyway, it's kind of edge case when we, when we would like to have swapping enabled. And so when our containers will uh, exceed the memory limit put by a Kubernetes via Docker, uh, then cgroups would kill this, this container. So this sounds quite scary because, okay, <laughs> exceeding memory is quite often thing, right? So, uh, well, our application would be killed at any time we exceed memory limit. Well, nothing scary because JVM takes care of itself not to exceed the memory limits, right? Because JVM sees the available RAM that is being given. We, we put a, uh, an option of, of keeping heap and off heap memory limited, and so Java will, will not ask for more memory, more memory than it's given. There will be a like um, internal out of memory error on JVM earlier than cgroups will kick in and kill uh, the container. And so, uh, it, because you know the the memory limits of the pods may exceed the physical limitation of the pod, what will happen if it happens? So, what happens if uh, all the pods, uh, the, the totally requested memory from all the pods exceed the physical capacity of the node? What will happen? Swapping is disabled. <laughs> yeah. Eviction, exactly. Kubernetes starts eviction, that means rescheduling pods to fulfill the memory needs. Uh, so is it worth at all to put memory limit bigger than memory request? So yeah, there will be eviction, so something that we don't want typically, right? Uh, yes, it is. there is sense for putting this, because uh, imagine we have four pods, right? There is like buffer of additional, I don't know, one gig, 50, 50, 100 of, of megabytes of memory, like space, uh, like free to use by, by them all. And if there is a memory peak at one of them, it consumes this, this buffer, then it like it's being released and goes on with computation. And basically it's good to put it bigger just due to the fact that there, there might be memory peak on only one of the pods. If it happens on all the pods, then yeah, they will eventually eventually uh, be evicted by, but if it happens at only one, then it's fine, and we, we it's still gain, we, we, we don't kill this, this pot in this way. Okay, live demo. So um, I said so far that the best way to, uh, to find the proper memory values for the, uh, for the JVM to, is to find them empir empirically. I will start a simple application and I will execute a wonderful tool called jconsole. Maybe I will increase it a bit. Uh, jconsole is a tool coming from JDK package, so uh, it's nothing, uh, nothing very like mysterious. So there is a, a Java process running in the background. I know that its main class is this one comes with Borgdata ETL main, and let's connect with uh, jconsole to this process. It will ask me in a while uh, if I'm mm, afraid of insecure connection. Of course I'm not, because I'm connecting locally, so nothing to be scared about. And basically this process is running in the background, and we will see how it starts consuming memory. Uh, let's wait for, for a while. Uh, okay, so it starts collecting data and few things to notice. Okay, let's go to the memory. Um, I'm not sure if it's visible at the end, but I can't increase it because it's like not very maintained, maintainable software. So basically, what you can see here is that the memory goes up and down, right? This, this blue line is the used memory. And this used memory is basically all the memory taken by factual objects in the heap. So it's going up and down. Why? Because GC is working, right? We allocate objects, we free them, and so on. And basically, here on the bottom, we have um, we have a table we, we have in which we have used value. This is something which is displayed here, committed, 
committed value of memory is the memory that JVM asked operating system and operating system allocated it to JVM. And only part of this committed memory is factually used. The other part is like not yet accessed, not yet filled with the objects. And we have max value, which here is, I don't know if you see, I will re re read it. It's eight gigs. Why eight gigs? Because on my Mac, let's, let's check about this Mac. On my Mac, I have 32 gigs, and the default value for the maximum heap size in one is one fourth. So one fourth of 30 gigs is eight something, eight, eight gigs something. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And so uh, what we see that it will probably go upper and upper. Uh, and this is heap, and we can also see non-heap space. So as a heap was around 600 megabytes, non-heap is below 200 megabytes, right? So we can see some, we, we can grasp some kind of intuition what's the ratio between those spaces. And one more thing that I will show is the top command uh, showing the um, resource consumptions of all the processes. And we can see that our JVM process is taking currently something around 900, megabyte, yeah, 900 megabytes. And this is roughly the sum of the, of the heap and non-heap. So, uh, so committed uh, non-heap is below 200. Uh, one 180 and heap is around let, around 800 so now it should be more now yeah now it increased so basically it's uh, here is 900 m and plus because it's like estimated value basically and and so uh, we may see that proportions are like heap 8 and non heap 2 something like this so 80% for heap should be enough, sh should be okay, but you know, we need to keep it safe, so it's better to decrease the, the ratio for heap to 60% to have a safe buffer for non-heap and additional things that may happen on the node. For example, we, we want to connect to the, to the container with some kind of console, some kind of debug tool, and we still should have some kind of available memory there reserved. Um, oh. Okay, and that's it. Let's get back to, to our slides. Mm -hmm. Yes, th there, there were screenshots in case something breaks. Okay, what will be gains for from our calibra calibration? So we, we, we got know about some things, how to, how to um, monitor it, how to calibrate it. What will be the, the advantage of doing this? So basically, in case we calibrate those parameters correctly, we will uh, prevent unnecessary up thro throttling. So especially when we remove the CPU limit parameter, then our application won't be limited on the times when it can safely use the whole power on, on, of node because there, there's an idle time, right? And, and again, if we calibrate the memory parameter uh, in correct way, we won't have situation, or maybe I, I will show you something. Let's get back to J console. Uh, so we, we see now that the highest value of memory taken at time is around 500 megabytes. What if I uh, put heap limit to 400 megabytes. So I start again my problem, my program with, with heap limit of 400 megabytes. What will happen? Yeah? Yeah, J, JC will, GC will be executed more frequently. So, so is, is it a problem? No, my application will execute. Yeah, nothing critical, but it will be executed with much less performance. So when I find properly the value of maximum memory, I'm gaining the, the performance, or I'm increasing the performance of, of the application. And of course, if we calibrate those parameters better and we remove unnecessary uh, up throttling, we can save money because we, we may end up in a situation that we do not need that big cluster anymore. So we cut down the size of the cluster by 20%, and so our b monthly bill at cloud provider. And, s and again, uh, we may also uh, take advantage of the, of the fact that our 
uh, pods won't be evicted that often if we put the proper limits and proper ratios. And final uh, calibration recipe. So, um, two things, two parameters per thing. CPU, uh, we start with request. So what, what should be the value for CPU request? It should be value big enough for normal app execution. So we execute our app, sees around how much, how, how much CPU time it uses within the hour, and we put this, this as a request. We do not put CPU limit, as I said before, but uh, on the other hand, we, we, we need to keep in mind this parameter, runtime, get runtime available processors used by gar garbage collector and JIT and so on. And we potentially, we put request to low value and we do not put limit, we pot potentially would like to bump it up a little bit by this parameter, active processor count. Regarding memory, uh, the only and uh, only effective thing is to empirically test what's the me memory consumption, as I did now with, for, for example, with J console, and then sum the heap size, non-heap size, non-heap size, add some additional safety buffer and put this as a request, and then as a limit, uh, put a value which is 10, 20, maybe 25 percent bigger. And we need to bump this parameter, max run percentage, because the default value is 20, 25 percent, right? And as we saw, it's typically the, 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 it's typically the case that the heap is 8 to 2 to non-heap or something like this. So also having some kind of free space, putting max run percentage to, to 60 percent is typically a good value. So that's it. Have a great life as DevOps. And remember, Swissburg is hiring. And have a wonderful day. And thank you for your attention. To not to uh, keep you any longer, I will stay here for a couple of more minutes to give swags for the people who uh, um, answered correctly and also if you have any questions come to me I will be happy to answer if I will be able to thank you again